So thank you everyone for joining us today. Uh, welcome to our ArabNet webinar on the state of commerce in the new normal, risks, opportunities, and new realities. Um, this webinar is brought to you by ArabNet in partnership with MasterCard. Um, I'd like to start off with a little brief uh, about this webinar and what we will be discussing. So as we know, COVID created uh, the biggest opportunity for the e-commerce industry. Um, at the same time, some large e-commerce businesses started struggling amid, amid the increased uh, demands. We also know that uh, predictions show brands with online presence will see a significant growth this year, uh, while many traditional retailers will direct their efforts towards growing online. Now, I'd like to introduce myself. My name is uh, Dana Leben. I was the chief investment officer at a mass market e-commerce company that was based out of Dubai. And prior to that, I uh, worked on corporate uh, venture capital side for 2454 and Dubai Silicon Oasis doing direct and indirect tech investment deals. Now, I think it's a privilege for me to introduce to you today the esteemed panelists. So I'll start off with um, the ladies. Sonali Bhatia is the Vice President of Strategic Merchants Middle East uh, and Africa at MasterCard. We have Edward Sabah, the Managing Director of Farfetch in the Middle East. Uh, Mr. Abdulaziz al Rani, the Co-Founder and CEO of Flowered, among other things. And we have also Mazen al Zarab, the Founder of Zid. So Sonali and uh, gentlemen, would you kindly like to introduce yourself and maybe uh, give a little bit of information about the companies you're representing? So maybe we can start off with Sonali. Thank you, Dana. Thank you for the introduction and um, thank you, Arabnet, for the opportunity to be here. Um, as you um, rightly said, you know, looking after the merchants uh, for Middle East and Africa, and this basically the remit is for retailers, um, airlines, um, hospitality partners in the region. Um, you know, we're often mistaken as MasterCard being only a credit card company. We actually uh, pride ourselves in terms of being a technology partner with expertise in the payment field. So um, we allow our partners to, you know, own the journey um, and own the commerce journey with their consumers. And we um, equip them with all the tools that are required across, whether you know it's uh, digital experiences, it's payments, it's safety, it's data. So that's that's the piece that we're working with with the merchants. Great, thank you, um, Edward. Would you like to introduce yourself? Hi, everyone, and uh, thank you for having me. So, um, so yeah, my name is Edward. I'm the managing director for the Middle East for Farfetch. For those of you who haven't heard of us or shop with us, um, Farfetch is uh, a leading global technology platform for really specialized for the luxury industry. So in a nutshell, looking at our businesses, our uh, predominant one, which is the most famous one, is Farfetch.com, which is a marketplace that connects uh, basically brands and boutiques around the world um, from over 50 countries to customers all around the world in where we ship to over 190 countries. Um, we also have another business unit called uh, Farfetch Platform Solutions, which offers uh, white label uh, e-commerce solutions, uh, you know, with some clients such as Harrods, uh, a, a few companies from LVMH, but we also offer augmented retail um, solutions where one of our big clients is Chanel that we started with a, a year ago. Um, we also have a, a few other businesses. We've recently acquired um, Stadium Goods, which is a marketplace for exclusive sneakers. Uh, New Guards Group, which operates licenses um, of Off-Whites, Palm Angels, and many others. Right, thank you. Uh, Abdulaziz. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Abdelaziz Al Lohani. I am the co-founder and CEO of Flowered. Uh, Flowered is, in essence, a merge between uh, flowers and word in Arabic, which is an online, full-fledged uh, flowers and gifts uh, platform. Uh, we currently manage the uh, full kind of supply chain of uh, flowers, um, with the exception of farming and farmers and growers. 
currently operating out of uh, seven cities in the GCC and uh, hopefully reaching a wider audience uh, into other continents by the beginning of next year. I'm also involved in a number of uh, entrepreneurial initiatives, uh, whether it's in Kuwait or elsewhere around the Arab world. Pleasure and humble being with you. Great, thank you very much. And last but not least, uh, Mazen. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for having me. My name is Mazen al -Darab. I founded a company called Zid. Uh, at Zid, we, uh, our main role is to offer uh, the e-commerce uh, experience in a box for uh, retailers from micro to small and medium size, uh, whereby we offer them um, the technical solution and also the integration with the supply chain uh, in a, along with uh, um, having a very um, um, a local support team where they will help businesses throughout their journey until they um, scale up. From the name Z uh, means scale. This is our ultimate goal is to enable those merchants to sell uh, and to scale. Um, we have, we've uh, enabled uh, more than 3,500 merchants in Saudi and uh, soon we are rolling up out to GCC before the end of this year, and hopefully throughout MENA, inshallah, in the next couple of years. Uh, I'm really glad to be part of this panel. Great, thank you very much. Now, you know, the pandemic is impacting everyone and everything, including startups and businesses, as we said. Um, we can say that there has been almost this pause button that has hit the economy, um, and depending on the different industries, some businesses are more impacted than others. Uh, now, e-commerce in general is one industry that has benefited from this uh, situation. So why don't we start with our first question, um, and that is the users. So the user habits have changed uh, to a certain extent. What are the changes that you are seeing from your respective businesses and industries? And will things go back to the normal? Or is this the new norm and things will not go back to as they used to be? So why don't we start off with, uh, with Abdulaziz? Very well. So uh, prior to COVID, I think we've seen uh, a revolution and widespread uh, acceptance and adoption of uh, internet access across the Arab world. Um, and if you look back 15 years ago and fast forward 15 years, the acceleration of internet adoption in the Arab world uh, has reached to around 75% penetration, which is uh, in, in, in which is the average, but in some countries we've seen uh, close to 90 and 95% penetration. And our bet was over the next 10 years, we will see e-commerce penetration. So if you zoom out, we are in a $3.5 trillion economy in the Arab world, of which 29 billion of that is actually online, which is a fraction of a percentage. Now, if you zoom in and scratch that surface, between three industries, I would say uh, the, the majority plus 80% of that 29 billion is between three to four verticals online. But the rest is, is probably a wide desert. Now, I think if I were to um, double click and zoom into flowers, the vertical we're currently operating in, uh, we've seen an yani, e-commerce penetration uh, increased significantly. Market size has relatively shrunk. We estimated between 30 to 35 uh, percent of the cut flowers vertical in the GCC. Uh, however, uh, many of the brick and mortar shops, traditional uh, businesses are actually winding down and are unable to um, basically uh, transact with their customers. We've seen an increase in lifetime value by at least 25% on average from our customers. And we've seen uh, retention rates when you look at uh, a, yeah, I mean, uh, January, February, March cohorts of our new customers and the retention, it's increased by actually two folds over the past uh, six months, I would say. So I think if our bet was on uh, e-commerce penetration was to happen over the next uh, 10 years, hopefully reach more than 3% uh, to 5% in the Arab world. I think we've already 
kind of over the past three months since COVID reach to the targets we had in mind. Um, how long will that continue? I think is a question that is relevant, uh, that is more relevant depending on the vertical you are in. So in, in flowers and in cut flowers and uh, gifts specifically, managing expectation is the key kind of trigger. And in our part of the world, uh, flowers and gifts is, uh, is a two, a double-sided uh, customer where you have senders and then you have recipients. For the recipients are actually quite different from senders. Our behavior uh, in terms of personal consumption is a lot lower than other parts of the world. Uh, we think that our flowers vertical will continue uh, in terms of that e-commerce penetration and actually maintain similar growth rates over the next uh, 12 months, which is probably the, uh, the most we can predict given the circumstances we are in right now. So we think that uh, that behavior will continue, is already continuing, uh, even when we've seen over the past, I would say, 15 to 30 days, we've seen a lot of uh, cities slash countries open up uh, gradually, uh, and, uh, and the take rates have actually been uh, quite the same, quite similar, and will probably continue to increase over the next four months. Great, thank you very much. Um, Edward, what about from your perspective and from Farfetch? Yeah, so I mean, similarly, um, when uh, when COVID crisis started, obviously the the, the biggest shift that happened, and, our, and I'm going to speak about the luxury industry, luxury personal goods industry. Uh, what what essentially really happened in the beginning was obviously a huge shift from um, offline to online. Uh, it was obvious. I mean, you know, many countries, many cities were locked down, um, and and even now, as the restrictions ease, um, we we were. Obviously, people are still are going out, but we're still seeing that you know there's still the stickiness in the in the online. We still don't have um, numbers, but we do know kind of looking at the overall um, luxury industry, this expected to dro to drop by 35% this year. But obviously, it's a different story in the online sector. Now, is is this going to how long is this going to last? I, you know, it's just very important. You know, COVID. Um, if, if anything, just accelerate a, a trend which we've always known. Um, um, just kind of like rewinding to, to January 1st, 2020, 12%, um, this is a global number, 12% of all luxury um, industry was transacted online. And, the, and the, that, that's uh, based on numbers which are released by Bain, which focuses on the luxury market. And that number, that contribution was expected to reach 25% uh, 20, by 2023. So we already knew that most of the growth was gonna come from e-commerce, so that this was nothing new. Uh, what definitely happened is this huge acceleration. So the latest updates that we have is that this year, e-commerce um, in the um, luxury industry will kind of reach 20%, and they've revised um, the, the 2023 expectation to um, 30%. Now, it's, it's, it's very important to note that, you know, here we are talking about where the transaction happens. You know, this doesn't mean that even when somebody buys in the store, we do know that at least 75% to 100% of their um, purchases are influenced by, by an online. But, but, but yeah, it's, it's been, but I, I do believe that the biggest, I guess, change and was also going to drive this growth further was the supply shock that happened. Um, and, and the luxury industry is, is, was notoriously late to it. Obviously, not, not far-fetched because we've, we were born 12 years ago as a digital, as an e-commerce uh, platform. But kind of just going back to, again, to earlier this year, we still had some of the largest brands, largest retailers, which had very limited. They've always used to see e-commerce potentially as more of a good to have, um, maybe sometimes a marketing channel. Um, and obviously that has changed. And, and, and we saw that as well, obviously when that happened, we, 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 when, when, when somebody buys from Farfetch, this item will come from a store. So the amount of work that we had to do, we had to change everything to really focus on supporting these businesses, many businesses, which for them, 100% of their sales were happening on Farfetch at some point. Um, but yeah, so I, I do believe also that the increase in supply, plus given this new shock um, that happened on the demand side, 
will um, kind of change. But it's important to also note that this is nothing new and e-commerce has always been the growth factor of our industry. Great, thank you so much. And Mazen, from your perspective, uh, because you work with e-commerce businesses and you are the enabler, how do you see it from, uh, from your side? I think your mic, yeah. yep. Um, uh, things really, uh, just to reinforce what Abdelaziz said, uh, uh, we serve 14 vertical in this industry. And as uh, Abdelaziz uh, clearly spotted, uh, some of uh, those uh, segments were booming, like for example, the, the pharmacy, the, the pharmacy segment, uh, uh, the food and beverage, uh, it, it boomed uh, really nicely in this uh, epidemic and the demand increased big time. Um, for some, uh, did not, uh, but um, they took the time during, the, um, during the, the period to be prepared. When it comes to the consumer, the end consumer, the buyer, um, we've seen uh, interesting insights. One of which is the increase in demand. Uh, so basically, um, we have more than 1.5 million customers, end customers. Um, we've seen the frequency of people repeated. So uh, uh, not the lifetime value per se, but the, um, the frequency of buying online increased uh, due to the lockdown and et cetera. But also um, they would go and buy uh, other stuff. Uh, the second uh, is the, um, the existence of new persona that's never been before, which is the first time, first timers, e-commerce buyers. So people who would go and buy online, either from a local brand, some of which are usually, um, uh, usually buy stuff from international websites. We've seen really good uh, uh, first timers who usually buy stuff, but not from local e-commerce stores. Uh, the second is people with the uh, persona that is uh, people with the high age group where they tried e-commerce because it was the only uh, way that they can buy their stuff online. So this is two new, uh, I would say, persona that I hope um, or I, be, I believe they will remain after the, um, after the epidemic uh, and they will continue to become uh, an interesting segment. One last thing that we've noticed but in other industries is that uh, um, the tendency of um, marketplaces becoming super apps. So basically people would go and uh, for apps like Jahaz, uh, Hunger Station and Kareem, they would expect that they will find everything there, not only one segment. Uh, the super app um, uh, phenomena would increase. People would go to one place and they want to, to be served from one place. Uh, this is now becoming a trend and uh, users would be expecting that you will sell everything in one place. Okay, that's really interesting. And so I think we all agree that, you know, COVID has accelerated e-commerce trends and purchasing online. But I'd like to ask you, is there actually anything new apart from more people transacting online, the frequency, um, you know, the lifetime value of, of the customers increasing? Is there anything else that you see that is fundamentally changing? Uh, maybe we can start off with Sonali. Yeah. Sorry, I was on mute. Yeah, so I think from a MasterCard perspective, right? I mean, it's no secret and what the other panelists have also voiced is saying, e definitely has grown. But what we also see is, uh, you know, on certain categories picking up more than the other. So again, grocery, for example, picked up almost on terms of online search for about 560%, right, in just the grocery period. Um, we saw new players coming in in the last mile. So, you know, you had grocery stations that couldn't deliver. And then you had some new players that came in to uh, fill the gap there. Um, contactless was another piece that picked up drastically, if you look at it. So it was almost in some countries, it grew 4x. Um, in a way it was under penetrated UAE, we saw a growth of about 100%, Saudi was almost 3x. What was also really interesting is fueled with the regulations, for example, in Saudi, um, for delivery, you were not allowed to collect cash. So that as well fueled a behavior um, towards a digital or electronic payment. Um, and, you know, nicely enough, we see that behavior continuing. So it wasn't just for that March period, people are adopting electronic payments more and more. The other thing that we see is ATM withdrawals have reduced a lot, right? So people are 
um, using cash less. Maybe it's because of hygiene reasons. Maybe it's because of the adoption of the behavior. Um, so that's that's also been interesting. Um, another, you know, I'll just cite two other examples that are very very interesting. In Iraq, um, you had uh, the that the directorate which was distributing Mastercard holder Mastercard cards. Uh, by drones to the senior citizens so that they could use um, the money for online shopping. Um, now, again, it goes out to say, you know, because the options were less, the adoption was happening. Similarly, Jumia reported about um, in the month of March that there were 50% more online purchases that happened. So I think irrespective of the sector, we saw an adoption, whether it was contactless, you know, it was just driving away the cash piece. So that was really interesting. Um, in terms of categories that, of course, you know, similar to what Mazen said, um, it was grocery that grew across um, the region. And I guess it was also got to do with the behavior of how people were looking at spending their disposable income. So it was more in terms of what is the necessity versus what could be, you know, a luxury or a treat um, in terms of uh, spoiling yourself. So it was grocery, pharmacy. Retail, of course, was a third that was, um, you know, trending. Fast food, initially fast food was something that people were deterring from, from ordering outside, but I think sooner or later they gave into that. And then transit was another piece that picked up quite nicely um, in terms of contactless and electronic payments. Okay, great. What about um, Edward in the, in the luxury segment? Um, any e-commerce trends that you've, uh, you've noticed? I mean, obviously the, the big one was really the the new customers and and I think for us it's 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 important because one of the main especially when you talk about luxury you know you the you're talking about big average baskets and, and you're talking about people kind of placing an order and committing to a purchase um, of course again going by category but if you want to talk about ready to wear you know there's sizing issues there is um, and all, all, all these kind of blockers and what we've seen obviously is 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 that uh, there was a lot of new customers people that never shopped um, online um, we also have to also consider that, you know, the Middle East, especially the GCC, is, has a very high mall culture. Um, so so we, we, we have seen some people who have substituted some of these purchases who could perhaps go to the mall and, and, and have now um, shopped online. Obviously, even us, you know, Farfetch, we don't believe that the stores will die. And, 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 and you know, we, we strongly believe that, for example, you know, it, it, it has to happen both ways. So, for example, you could be shopping online. And then um, you could uh, find something that you like. You could go to the mall, try them. Obviously, there's lots of technologies around, you know, how to try something even from your phone. But, but regardless of that, even today, um, trying on is, is something which, and, and we actually push it uh, as, as well. And on the other side also, um, people can go to malls and the stores. They could pick items that they like, and then they can actually go online. One advantage that online gives to you is, is it, it really usually gives you a much larger assortment. So you can look at different colors, different cuts from different brands. So what's very important is that these two worlds cannot be against each other. Um, so I, I think that was the biggest trend. In terms of categories, obviously, I get asked that question a lot. Um, I, th I think, first of all, people are still buying luxury. So I think it's, this is good because it also gives you, tells you a bit more about the, the consumer confidence. Obviously, as I've said before, the pie overall is strong, but, but there, there has been, and kind of looking at the brands, um, it was still the same brand. So, you know, all our, our top brands, the rankings have not um, changed so much. It's, it's quite obvious that you will have some categories, like for example, evening gowns, um, you know, was not the first priority of, of a lady, you know, on, on the first week of the crisis. And so we have seen um, some spikes in active wear, leisure wear, even some, um, some home wear and whatnot. So we have seen that, but, you know, even today kind of, I'm not saying we're, we're past COVID, but you know, it's been a few months. We are seeing pick up again in dresses and, and whatnot. So there, there has been a shift. I do not foresee a huge category shift. I think the biggest um, kind of shift will probably be more between the online and the offline. Okay, great, thank you. Abdulaziz, from, uh, from Flower's perspective, are there um, you know, any specific trends that you've noticed um, that stand out? Um, this time I'll reverse it. So I'll start very uh, flower level and maybe zoom out. Um, from, from a supply chain perspective, uh, again, we're full-fledged e-commerce. So we actually procure flowers from different parts of the world. 
and then we uh, forward them to the different cities we operate in. We have our own warehouses, our own workshops, where we do all the arrangements. And then based on demand, we dispatch to and manage the last mile delivery. So based on that, we have seen uh, at the early beginnings of COVID, so this is in March, April, uh, some interruption in our supply, uh, where we've seen some ports uh, not operate at full capacity. A lot of stock and uh, goods were actually uh, sitting in the ports for different uh, reasons. Uh, so we have seen some interruption of, of supply at the early beginnings, but that has smoothened out and is right now commercially operating actually quite uh, smoothly. Uh, number two, uh, we've noticed that uh, marketing overall as a function when it comes to uh, digital marketing uh, in terms of customer acquisition or retention uh, on, on a customer or a order level has gone down significantly. For when you look at, say, paid search and how much uh, are people paying or bidding, on certain AdWords or even on other social media platforms, we've seen that uh, these numbers have gone down uh, quite sharply. Uh, I think uh, businesses overall uh, are, are more concerned with cash uh, nowadays, but the tendency to outbid others has gone lower and has left the market with more uh, opportunity for, for larger players to kind of dominate. I feel that's something we've we've witnessed yeah, across uh, different markets. Number three, uh, unit economics and the attention being paid to unit economics is something that uh, ourselves and uh, and we feel many other companies have started paying a lot more attention to. So, yeah, the age of buying growth and really op operating at negative gross levels. I think it will, st will slowly start that, yeah, and it will slowly st start seeing that investors are shying away from that model. Uh, we've seen it a bit earlier in other parts of the world, mainly in the West. Uh, and I, I think this is becoming a lot more evident uh, in our part of the world. But there's more attention to unit economics being paid by founders themselves to ensure sustainability regardless of their uh, of the investors' appetite, as well as investors themselves. Um, number four, we are witnessing a lot more, um, I would say, uh, leniency towards M&A activity. I think a lot of egos have been uh, grounded nowadays, and it's become a lot more rational and easier to have a consolidation uh, activity in our part of the world and we firmly believe that we will see some of that happening uh, over the next 12 months a lot more actively than uh, than it used to be in, in the past. Well, lastly, uh, I think the best example is an imagine I'm preaching to the choir over here but I think uh, yani Saudi being the largest economy in the whole MENA region has, uh, has actually proved how committed government is towards the asset class. So, uh, I, I feel that uh, these, are, these are remarks that are quite evident and uh, sovereigns have not pulled out any money. They are still uh, uh, any committing to their capital calls with the different managers they're invested in. Uh, Saudi is growing more than ever when it comes to number of transactions that are happening. And I think that effect is being trickled down to other economies or other uh, uh, sovereigns in the Gulf primarily, where we see uh, more sovereigns investing in the asset class uh, than, than ever. We also feel that it's the same with even traditional investors, you know, brick and mortar investors. Uh, with deposits almost generating zero yields, real estate, no one really knows where that's going, uh, and many other ca asset classes, including public equities, not really performing well. Uh, we feel that venture capital as an asset class is a lot more attractive than it used to be. 
Um, so we are seeing a lot of interest from different investors in, 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 in flower or even in other companies that, uh, that we are invested in ourselves. Great, thank you so much. And I think some very valid points there um, in terms of also the investors and the whole ecosystem. Um, Mazen, um, what about from your perspective and from Zid? Um, throughout the whole supply chain, a lot of interesting um, uh, things happened. Uh, I just want to pick up on uh, Sonari's point when it comes to digital payment. That was by force. Uh, shipping companies were, I would say, pushed uh, not forced to to in, to encourage people to pay either online on the sites or even on delivery. So the COD now became card on delivery, not cash on delivery, throughout the the the, um, uh, the, um, the epidemic. And what's really interesting, it's now carrying uh, this trend is uh, is now becoming a, uh, it's continued. So it wasn't only for uh, for this specific period but it, it actually continued uh, afterwards. We've seen a very interesting model whereby shipping companies usually, if you choose to, to pay uh, on card on delivery or even cash on delivery, they will send you a link whereby you would pay. They will remind you or they will push you to pay as a customer uh, online. Uh, to ourselves, we, we saw uh, an increase in digital payment, uh, 3X uh, in what we used to, ha uh, to have. Plus, a lot of merchants, micro, small, and medium, were rushed to activate online payment. They were thinking uh, online payment is not, um, and customers will not adopt it. They had those uh, thoughts. Uh, apparently, the uh, COVID proved them all uh, not wrong, but uh, showed the real, uh, the real thing. Actually, most of them now either switch off uh, cash and delivery or switch off bank transfers and replace them with Apple Pay and digital payment in general. Um, for the logistics part, um, it is actually the, I would say if, if one thing ruined uh, the great acceleration, it would be um, last mile delivery companies. They were not up to the, I would say, um, up to the challenge or up to the growth level that happened some of which is lack of preparation, some of which actually this is a new thing that no one ever witnessed before. So uh, this is a, uh, a normal thing. We, we are trying to give them some excuses, but uh, to tell the truth, uh, one uh, interesting model happened that the reliance of each retailer on their own fleet, so they formed their own fleets to, to make it possible for them to continue their business. Uh, this is actually, I would, I would call it a, a red sign or an alarming sign where the efficiency of a person who's not in the business of logistics would beat a company that's been in the logistics business for years. Um, that's uh, uh, quite alarming. Uh, but again, uh, we are seeing a lot of investment in last mile delivery uh, nowadays. Uh, CITC, for example, the, the government body and official license for over than 25 uh, logistics company in this epidemic only. Uh, which is interesting and uh, will hopefully encourage investors to invest more in uh, the last mile delivery part. Um, one thing I liked about what Abdelaziz mentioned, the marketing thing. Our merchants shift from being aggressive on influencers marketing and relying on influencers to market their products into performance-based marketing and trying um, other ways of marketing their products. Like for example, they uh, defaulted into re retargeting, email marketing, and uh, exploring new things, cheap, uh, cheaper ways of marketing, and new ways of marketing where they needed to learn and apply. The, this period gave them this chance to, to reach out to a new customers. So this is in a nutshell uh, highlights on what happened during the, uh, the, uh, the epidemic from Zed's uh, perspective. Right. So, I mean, from what we are hearing, um, COVID is not good for the society and economy, but so far it's, it's really great for e-commerce. Now, brick and mortar uh, retailers tried to go digital um, during this period. And as a result of that, you know, we've seen more direct to consumer D2C brands emerging um, and selling through platforms, let's say like Farfetch, uh, like social websites, Facebook, Instagram, but also their own websites. So Edward, from uh, your perspective, 
what's your take on these uh, D2C models? Um, do you think they're sustainable in the long run? And how do you see them playing out versus the platforms? Well, um, I think the, the unpopular answer here is really it depends. Um, I mean, in, in general, kind of, I, I strongly believe in this uh, version of like Adam Smith, the invisible hand, you know, just kind of let things work out. Uh, what's for sure is that um, you need any business, you need to have some sort of online presence. Now, whether that presence, and it depends really on your size, that presence could be an Instagram page, could be your own website, it, and it could be on, on a platform, and it could be on all. I mean, it, it's really hard to say kind of what everybody should do, um, but if I have to kind of like give one, I would probably say, probably it should be everywhere where it makes sense for you. So if a business wants to go D2C and have, for example, their own website, they also need to understand of what are their ambitions there. You know, you could build a website, obviously, and, and you know, focus on organic growth, but you know, that's actually sometimes good because I still remember kind of, um, well, not even a few years back, a few months back, where, for example, you, you would go online on, and you get some Instagram ads from some brands. And then, you know, as a user, I'm interested. And then I swipe up and there's nothing to swipe up to. Like, it'll give me a store locator. And how, how is that helping me, you know? So maybe even there, it doesn't have to be a full-fledged e-commerce. It could be even some more details about it. So, so I think it, it really depends. Now, being on a platform, again, the platform has to make sense for you. Um, from, from a consumer perspective, kind of looking at, at almost all industries, we have seen that one or two platforms in every pretty much most industries, probably the most developed one, but maybe in, mo in other ones, have taken the lion's share of the market. So kind of, if you look at in, in music, you have Spotify, and Apple Music, maybe Anrami here. In movies, you have Netflix, Amazon Video. In social, you have uh, Facebook, Facebook Group, um, Snapchat. So the, the, the platform play from a consumer perspective makes sense. It's a place where you find pretty much more things and you have this network effect that kind of allows these platforms to grow and grow. Now, but platforms doesn't mean anything because as a platform, and us being a platform, we have, a, we have another customer that perhaps a D2C doesn't have, which is them, you know? So we, a, a platform cannot exist in the long term if it's not adding value to the partner, to the brand, to whatever it is. So I can, I can only speak about Farfetch, but I mean, again, I, I can pretty sure that if you speak to any platform um, out there, they'll tell you about how they add value because they are charging a fee to it, of course. So, you know, at Farfetch, for example, we allow a store to really reach this, um, this uh, database active of customers all over the world. I mean, we have beautiful stories of these small mom and pop stores in Tokyo who are selling a customer in Oregon. And, and this transaction could never happen. You know, this, this Oregon could potentially have been to Tokyo and have bought there. But, you know, the way it happened, obviously, these are incremental sales. Um, we, we also even allow them, so we are a part of them, we even allow them to buy better. You know, we, we know that in the, in, the, in the luxury industry, which is, um, you know, we, there, there's buyers that take a certain level of risk before a certain season. Now, that obviously might change in the future. It's just another wake-up call of COVID-19. But kind of having Farfetch as this extra platform that allows you to sell more, allows some of our buyers, um, to the, the buyers of, of, of the brands, to take more risks and, and whatnot, and, and overall, even improve that. So in general, you know, as a platform, if you're not adding value at some, you know, you might get a partner, but then they will leave you at some point. So, and, 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 and from a brand, I, I think it, it really, it's about making sure that one, you have some sort of representation. I, I do believe, and I, you know, a lot of, um, a lot of the partners on Farfetch have their own e-commerce website, and we're not really competing in some ways. Um, it's, it's important to have some representation. It's important to treat digital or innovation, not necessarily just e-commerce, as today a must-have. You know, it, it, there's no need to make a point about how many people have an iPhone or an Android. Um, and uh, it's important to choose the right platform. Each platform can bring, it has to add value to you and it has to make sense to you. So I, I don't know if I answered the thing. I would probably say that you should probably do all and you should uh, decide at what level of investments you want to do based on what makes sense, you should try. And if it doesn't work, then you can, you know, slow down or move and, and, and move budgets around. Yeah, that's, that's clear. And thank you for that, Edward. I think it also um, helps, you know, merchants that are watching this webinar to, to understand that a little better. 
Now, um, Mazen, when we move to e-commerce enablers, um, they're also very essential, right, in the ecosystem. You have uh, the Canadian company Shopify, which has seen its stock rise during the pandemic quite significantly. They even did a big partnership with uh, Facebook earlier this year to allow Shopify merchants to control customization and merchandising of their storefronts. What is missing um, in the e-commerce enabler space in our region? Um, do payments and delivery on demand plugins operate well? Um, and if so, where do you see room for improvement? Um, yeah. Uh, that's actually a very great question. Uh, I, would, I would summarize the issues uh, into two uh, uh, points. First is onboarding and launching the store, launching the uh, presence, especially for those who, who, who are not already established online. So uh, details like, for example, having e-catalog, photography, uh, um, putting the strategy of multi-channel commerce that Edward just touched on, getting the, the executives or the, 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 uh, the brand uh, conscious about how to go online, this is one challenge. From very simple thing uh, as catalog building all the way to how are you going to, to deal or be present online. Um, this is a stopper uh, and we, like for example in Zed, and during the epidemic we had a big onboarding team where they will go in and help each merchant to go online. We will. We, we are very hands-on. Otherwise, they will not. If we leave it for them to do it by themselves, uh, in this culture, it will never happen. Uh, due to many things, uh, lack of human capital, lack of understanding, lack of even resources, online resources in Arabic. Like for example, yes, we are speaking English now, but a lot of people who works in this industry nowadays, especially in micro, small, medium. They don't know how to read or comprehend English tutorials online. So this, that was a very important add value that we believe this is, there are a big room for improvement. Uh, I still remember during that uh, epidemic, around seven agencies, seven digital marketing agencies and freelancers, they helped us to talk, take people online. So they built their business on top of uh, this problem. The second is um, scalability barriers. And this, this is endless, but if I would touch on two things or zoom in on two things and to be very specific is um, marketing and how to do it in a scalable way, not on the influencers uh, way, but how to do a proper uh, digital marketing slash performance based marketing properly uh, where you can, and uh, where you can control your operations, not just uh, uh, just hope that you will not get uh, orders that you cannot control from this influencer. The second is uh, last mile delivery and fulfillment. Uh, it's huge. We are seeing now a trend where a lot of third party logistics, four party logistics are taking the, um, taking the, I would say the heavy lifting from the merchants to do it themselves and let the merchant focus on their core activity, which is sourcing products and marketing them. Uh, this is great. Uh, for example, 25% of our merchants, of top selling merchants are uh, relying on third party logistics. So it's proven that if, if there are more of those, I would say third party logistics, fulfillment enablers, it will ignite the growth for many, many merchants. So this is uh, in a nutshell, the two elements uh, that hopefully after COVID, people would uh, think about it and uh, continue investing in it. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Mazen. And um, that's also interesting from your perspective, right, to understand that also the merchants have to be ready to go online because that's, that's critical, not just wanting to go online and use the plugins, but having your operations and your backend ready. Now, um, a question for Abdelaziz. Um, when it comes to e-commerce, there are different business models, and I think we'll not go um, into deep uh, in terms of what it means, but if you have uh, a business model on e-commerce, it can be search-based, it can be discovery-based. Amazon, for example, is a business model where it is very search-based. Uh, so if you go there and you know what you want to purchase, you type that in and you look for that product and you purchase it. Other platforms, let's say like Instagram, allow you to consume content and then you see a product that you didn't know you need uh, and, you, and you make that purchase on that platform. 
from your wealth of experience in building different startups, what do you think is important um, in the e-commerce space when deciding to build either a search or a discovery type of uh, shopping experience? I think for starters, يعني, if you look at very low on the hierarchy or the pyramid of the customer's value assessment, you, there are basic uh, elements that you need to master, not only be actually good at. So for e-commerce, it's primarily your product mix, depending on what vertical you're in, uh, value for money, pricing brackets, Uh, how good is your uh, customer care, um, transactioning, uh, user experience, uh, turnaround time and delivery. I think these are very, very basic uh, points on your value curve that you should always score uh, very high in. Beyond that is the part you're highlighting, which is, is it, is it more of a push or a pull when it comes to discovery? Am I searching or is the algorithm helping me find out more? And I think regardless, I mean, it varies from one vertical to the other, but for us, it's a lot more about uh, recommendations that are built around personalizing your experience. So if you go up the pyramid, if you go up the hierarchy, the purpose would be self-actualizing with the emotions and, uh, and, and the occasions you're experiencing rather than general experiences. So take, for example, an occasion that probably many people celebrate is Mother's Day, right? And despite it being unique to everyone, it is a general occasion versus uh, today is your daughter's birthday or your husband or your boyfriend's birthday. These are very personalized occasions that are private to you and you only. So the, the way we would build the customer experience for the next level is around how personalized that experience can be. And it could be to the extent of capturing certain data in your journey uh, that would allow us to earmark and tag uh, that event or that occasion in the following year or over the following month. It's what kind of events would you uh, basically develop in your retention plans uh, for the customer to make the product to him or her a lot more sticky. So I think to answer you in short, there is a great um, model. It's called the Customer Value Assessment by Bain. And uh, it really helps you understand the different layers of the customer's value that you should uh, assess in order for you to, uh, to relate to. And I think for us, in our vertical specifically, uh, it's a lot more about uh, discovery uh, and how much we understand your personalized events, occasions, celebrations, uh, even God forbid, Uh, bad occasions that we want to make sure uh, we want to avoid in the future, but focus more on the happy ones. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Um, I think maybe now we can uh, move on to and discuss what are the opportunities ahead. Um, so if we look at the international trends in e-commerce, um, social commerce is uh, booming. In China, you have different types of business model around uh, video buying or group buying. So uh, you have a company called Pinduoduo, which is seeing massive growth uh, thanks to an innovative way of selling online, right? So their model is the more friends that purchase a product, the higher the discount. Now, I'd like to discuss with you what you think are the trends uh, that we can see in our region emerging. Would it be social? Um, if not, why not? So maybe we can start with Sonali and talk also about uh, the digital payment trends um, and convergence of, of that perspective in the Middle East. And maybe also maybe Sonali, you can tell us the three bets that you see um, from the, your perspective. Um, I, you know, I don't think it's going to be one technology or one um, thing emerging on its own, right? What I think is really a very, very exciting time for payments and technology at this point. Um, we, 
my understanding is there should be a convergence of technology and there's a lot that's coming up there. So whether you look at 5G or you look at internet of things, um, artificial intelligence, you know, you look at how edge computing is now evolving versus cloud computing. Um, then you have the distributed le ledger technology. So it'll be very interesting to see how an amalgam of these technologies, what would be the user experience basis this, right? Um, in terms of some of the predictions or in some of the trends that I think are gonna be big going forward, one is definitely voice commerce, right? So if you look at, I think 2019 was about 2 billion in the US as a voice commerce market. And of that, I mean, 35% of the online purchase were, were of the total online purchases were powered by, the, uh, by uh, voice. Um, if you bring that to our region as well, it's seeing it's growing hugely. Um, there was a study done by Juniper, which talks about, you know, about 1.5 billion devices um, in, in 2018, and which is likely to grow to 8 billion um, devices by 2023. The, the industry is uh, predicted to be at about um, 100 billion by 2023. So that is a huge piece. And it's also got to do with the millennials um, adopting that way of purchase. You look at also the senior citizens, right? That becomes an easier way for them to interact. Um, in terms of use cases, we're seeing already bill payments, utility payments, adopting that in some parts of the world. Um, you see EasyJet as an example that's using that to book tickets uh, and also to drive engagement with the customers. So that's one piece. The other one, I think um, what Edward was alluding to earlier and as well as uh, Mazen was the super app or having marketplaces, right? I think in the years to come, what we will see is about 50% of the volumes should be through this marketplace or super app. And I think it's got to do with a consumer does not want to have multiple apps and multiple um, ways to go. They want to have one aggregated solution and there is a value that these bring in. What is this, you know, and again, to Edward's point is saying, what is the pain point that I'm solving for? And if you look at it more and more merchants are thinking about that. In the COVID world, um, when it just started in March, we saw one of the big hypermarkets um, in Kenya tying up with a marketplace, right? To do the delivery. So I think we're seeing that we saw that happening in Dubai Mall, where Dubai Mall also tied up with the marketplace. And so, so it's, it's something that we're seeing the adoption starting but it will probably be the norm. The other thing that I think we need to look at is e-commerce, of course, is there. But what will happen to the brick and mortar store, right? How are they going to be able to attract customers to come back? What is the value-added service that they're giving? Because again, in our part of the world, brick and mortar or the mall culture is really part of our culture, right? I mean, it's too hot to go and do something outdoors and you know, go into the desert every weekend when it's 45, 50 degrees outside. So culturally, I think that was part of our journey. What will the retailers be doing there? That would be interesting. I also think, um, you know, over probably 50 to 60% of the payments in the stores are going to be frictionless when, you know, going forward in the future. So whether it is looking at checkout kiosks or it's looking at self-checkout, something similar to what Amazon did as grab and go, uh, we could have probably some nuances that would need to take into, you know, our cultural behavior here. But I think that should be something that will come in if you look at the McDonald's stores already in our region, you've got the kiosks where you can go and check out because some, you know, in some of the malls or areas the queues are long. Um, I saw some of the retailers now looking at robotics. There was a big hypermarket that was looking at scan and, you know, you have like a, um, like to check out that they, they were using RFID and scanning and you could pick up your goods and go. So I think all of that is going to be quite big in our region. And um, yeah, so it's not just the online, but I think it should be the brick and mortar as well that we should see changing. Great, thank you. And I agree with you, Sonali, that you know, digital and tech adoption and just innovative solutions uh, have a very high acceptance rate in our region. Um, yeah. Edward, how about from your perspective? Yeah, I totally agree with Sonali. I mean, I mean, in general, it just it's gonna, it makes sense, right? With all the growth in in e-commerce, we're obviously going to see this whole industry around it that's just going to grow. It, it just makes sense. Uh, I don't know if uh, you know if you guys have read probably the Jeff Bezos book, but he does say that one of the ideas of why he built Amazon is he saw a report which said that web traffic was growing by 2,300%. So for him, it just made sense to kind of jump on that wagon. So I think definitely now as we see this 
I would say hype. I don't, honestly, it's not that new. E-commerce is not new, but anyway, for whatever reason, it, it, it seems to have clearly woken up today. We will see more and more investments on really anything that enables e-commerce from last mile to payments. And I do think we have so much to do as a region. I, I, I like to compare e-commerce here. It's still like, I don't know, from, at least from my age, I still remember when the TV, you had an antenna and you had to fix it to get the right, um, you know, right picture. Where, you know, and today, obviously, you just click a button and the TV shows and there's internet with it. We, we, we're, and it's, it's a metaphor, obviously, but we're still very far from that super perfect experience, which has no mistakes and whatnot. So I think more and more, and no company can do by themselves. You need an ecosystem to kind of build on that. Um, I think an, another thing which I really hope, uh, which we've seen is growing is something around sustainability and, and really mission-driven companies. Uh, you know, we, we've seen that growth in our personal, in, in, in the way for example, people shop. It's still not big enough to represent, but I, I, I really, it, it'll be a real shame that kind of coming out of COVID that we haven't learned and, and that, you know, us as an industry and as everybody um, don't kind of more and more uh, play a part in, in, in sustainability. And again, also strongly believe that mission driven, you know, what happened in COVID will also really highlight the companies, what they stand for, both in terms of customers, also in terms of their employees. Um, you know, all the actions they did will do that. So I think um, that will be a trend. Finally, and I, I, I would probably need an hour to talk about this trend, but um, maybe I'll talk more about what we should do is, is machine learning. I mean, we, 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 this is obviously a subset of artificial intelligence. This is really going to be one of the biggest things that will, will shake our world. It's, it's, we're seeing it now, but I don't think people still see where it's going to get. Obviously, you also have this whole thing of data is going to keep on growing and growing. We have this whole world, which is offline, which is today not even digitized properly. We like to call these, you know, one thing we wish we work on in store for the future is the idea of the offline cookies. So as more and more of these things grow, the ability for companies to use data is going to really give them some competitive advantage. It, it's not the only decider, but it will really, you know, it affects the way you show your customer um, and you drive your customer experience. It affects your operational performance and all this extra, let's say, profit you're going to make will be able to be reinvested and allow people to grow and grow. And it's very important that us in the Middle East, as all of us together, really come together and grow this because kind of looking today at the talent and the state of where we are, we, we, we are still very far behind from the rest of the world. We still import talent from that. We are, you know, we, we're doing lots of work to kind of groom talent fresh out of universities. But it's very important because that, that is going to be one of the big trends of the future. And as, and as a region, we just cannot import that. It cannot be. We have to build this in-house and it's, it takes a whole ecosystem. And I think it will happen, you know. Back in the day, at least when I graduated, it was cool to go and work in consulting with all my respects to consulting. But today, you're seeing more and more people going into tech, into data science. But we need to offer them the right jobs. We need to build an ecosystem that really supports them. No, that's a great perspective. And that's something, you know, I just read today somewhere on Twitter as well that uh, the consultants uh, are trying to move into the tech space because it's very exciting and very entrepreneurial. So, Mazlin, from your perspective, what's happening in you in Saudi Arabia and uh, what, are you, what are you seeing? What are the trends and what is the future? Uh, I could spend the whole day talking about the opportunities. Huge. Uh, just to pick up on Sonali's Sonali point, uh, the emergence of technology and business is becoming now interesting because today for a merchants to design their own bot, uh, it's affordable, it's becoming very affordable and it's becoming very easy to do. Today, a merchant with no technical experience can design using any of those tools available, a bot that can increase the number, increase the conversion to their, to their website by 40%. And this is a true story. This is not, um, I'm not making this up. One of our merchants did that and he, teaches to, uh, he taught it to other merchants and they did it. So uh, automation, but, uh, bots are now being interesting model where, uh, uh, especially in this region where people like the conversational commerce, uh, uh, it's happening on WhatsApp. Uh, unfortunately, WhatsApp is not uh, opened as we are expecting, but Telegram now is picking up, for example. Uh, WhatsApp themselves are now opening it up gradually, but I believe a big room for conversational commerce where uh, either by bot or even 
uh, link integrating it with your backend will be a, a very interesting trend to watch. Uh, second is, I would say, the fulfillment as a service concept. So instead of having this high, heavy asset uh, uh, fulfillment model, we will witness a fulfillment by uh, as a service concept. Shopify already did that for their customers and uh, in Canada and the US. I believe it's very um, um, interesting model that we should watch for. Uh, and um, for payment, um, very interestingly, uh, we should consider what happened after the epidemic. Uh, people will, will have issues and challenges when it comes to liquidity and cash. People lost their jobs and they still want to buy. So we've seen, especially in this region, a, a high trend when it comes to buy now, pay later uh, concepts. We've been approached by three companies at the same time, all local or all in, from the same region. And I'm really, I, I'm, I'm really excited why this took long years to, to be happened in Europe and America, they just took the concept and apply it, and they add the, the localized twist, I would say, to the model. I believe it, it is a, a, a trend to watch. Lastly, account-based um, payment. So uh, cards, as Sonali said, uh, uh, plastic cards are becoming, um, I would say, it will become part of the, uh, the past. Uh, people who start using uh, their accounts on uh, account uh, on um, um, uh, uh, solutions like STC Pay and uh, other uh, Halala, etc., uh, and also Mastercard and other companies. So they will start using their stored information when it comes to payment and pay directly. That will increase conversion, and hopefully will in encourage or build uh, a new industry on top of that, which is the points and reward and loyalty. Uh, system. This is in a nutshell what I believe what will happen in the future. Okay, that sounds very exciting. Um, and maybe from Abdulaziz, we could also get a perspective. Uh, yes, I mean, we try our best looking at our region as a homogeneous economy, right? We tell ourselves we have 450 million Arabs, there are 250 million internet users, and we try our best to treat it as one economy. In reality, yani doing business in Kuwait is different from Riyadh, different from Jeddah, different from Dubai, from Abu Dhabi is actually different, Not yani, even within the same country. But uh, despite, uh, because of, of uh, cultural reasons, uh, but I feel more importantly, because of legal and cross-border uh, reasons, we weren't able to really treat the region as one. And given the current circumstances with uh, budget deficits across the GCC, uh, with uh, COVID uh, situation, falling oil uh, prices, I think will drive uh, many economies to restructure ourselves, to restructure uh, ourselves uh, in the region and really uh, put private sector forward. In countries like Kuwait, for example, where 90% of the Kuwaiti workforce is state employed, uh, I don't think that's actually sustainable. And the current circumstances will drive governments, uh, first of all, to promote private sector a lot more. Uh, and then uh, number two, act more regionally. So I will definitely say that there will be a lot better integration between, uh, let's say, the transport of goods in the region. I think cross-border trading has to be a lot better. I mean, all of what we've seen in the past years is with nightmares happening on cross-border from different customs around different countries, right? Well, I think that will impact uh, businesses doing e-commerce regionally uh, positively because the transfer of goods, products is going to be a lot easier and hopefully, hopefully at that time, uh, we will really treat the region as well. No, I think that'd be great if, if the region was very homogeneous. I want to be mindful of our time. I think uh, we're going to close off with one last question and I think if, if you can provide a two, three sentence answer, that would be great. Um, for all the startups and merchants that are watching, 
what are the opportunities uh, on the market that you think uh, lie ahead or where is there room for improvement? So maybe we can start with Mazen. Uh, uh, you have, if you want to start a business, uh, you have to be optimistic. Uh, um, uh, otherwise, you shouldn't be in this business. Uh, uh, whatever happened in, during that past period, uh, as Edward just mentioned, take it as a learning and uh, just uh, it will give uh, people a lot of opportunities to be cautious about every single thing uh, in doing their business. Great, thank you. Edward? Hard to say in two sentences. Well, what I would say is, is really, I mean, the idea is really, and I've, I've done it twice in my life, is really not, not a, in any way significant um, if you want to start a business. I would say first is to what, what I call follow disciplined entrepreneurship. So it means really don't, it, it obviously it has to be a pain point and a pain point can, can signal an idea, but just to make sure that you test that hypothesis with the right people and to make sure that you are going. Obviously, business plans will never happen, I can tell you that, but, um, and you will probably shift and you'll move and everything, that's very normal. Uh, but it, it's, it's, it's very important that at least when you kind of think of the best case scenario, that it's really a very big scenario. I would say also, when you, when you know of that, move fast and don't think too much. Don't look at surveys, although there's a famous survey, 70% of transactions are cash on delivery. You know, we've launched so many years ago, we're the largest online luxury platform and we do 0% cash on delivery. It's really about who you're targeting, what you're doing. So don't follow these and don't let them deter you. And, and, and most and most importantly, make sure you have the smartest people around you. Um, this is really gonna be uh, one of the biggest factors. Uh, and I know people talk about it a lot, but it's, it's really about getting the right people and experience. For me, I don't hire an experience. I hire people who are just always gonna be willing to question themselves, question the status quo, we have high energy, and as Mazen said, optimistic, because it's, it's definitely a, a ride. Great, that is great advice, Edward. Abdelaziz? Um, yeah, so, so in terms of opportunity, uh, I highlighted that our e-commerce, uh, online basically penetration in the region is around 29 billion. If you break that 29 billion, uh, 21 billion is actually hotel and travel. And then you have uh, consumer electronics uh, right after that. And then you have FMB or fashion. These are probably three or four uh, established industries when it comes to e-commerce in the region. Well, the rest of the verticals and industries are uh, some of them are there are attempts there are uh, local regional attempts to really dominate those markets but when you look at as a whole for the region there aren't monopolies uh, all of the other verticals are real real opportunities and i'm not talking about yeah, any emerging technologies that you need to disrupt the market with no 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 this is these are the very low hanging fruits. Uh, for there are plenty of opportunities when it comes to untapped, uh, big offline markets with relatively online presence, how the number one. Number two is you don't really need to love the vertical. Yeah, the fact that you always pursue your passion, and, and I, I say it out loud, I'm, I'm not the best flowers guy, right? It's not like uh, flowers is my expertise. And sometimes you need to really love what you're doing in terms of scope of work rather than the vertical you're in. If you like growing companies, if you like finding opportunities and really digitizing these industries, you'll find plenty of them regionally. I, my, my note is don't be misled and you always need to love the vertical you're in. Sometimes the function can also be loved. Thank you. Okay. That's also great advice. And I think it's also good advice because we've been hearing from a lot of venture capital investors, there's a lot of e-commerce businesses in our region. So it's, uh, it's amazing that you say there is still potential and opportunity. And last off, Sonali, um, you know, from your perspective, what is MasterCard doing with, uh, with startups and SMEs to help the ecosystem? Oh, 
Um, thank you for that question. Uh, I think it's very interesting because more now more than ever, I think this is a time which is so right for all the people who are looking at doing something in terms of startups and entrepreneurial, uh, you know, kind of projects in the region. Uh, we as MasterCard actually have a two-pronged process, right? So one is we identify trends and future payment uh, behaviors, and we start working from an R&D perspective. Now, of course, this is not something that we can do alone. There's an ecosystem there. We have a program called the Start Path. And what Start Path does is basically identifies the upcoming fintechs or um, you know, these SMEs that have a proposition for the consumer journey. Um, currently, we have about 200 companies that are registered on the program, both regionally and globally. And we work with them and introduce them to our partners, whether they're banks, acquirers, uh, or merchants. And we either you know, work with them to get the referral going, or we try and bundle products together and get that going. Um, also, locally, we have an initiative with Hub 71, which is basically an initiative in Abu Dhabi. And we've signed up an MOU with them, again, to support the initiative and, um, you know, to fuel the innovation and see what, how we can help with our expertise and uh, our learnings in the region as well. So those are just some of the things that we're doing. And, uh, yeah, I think it's really an exciting time. Great. Well, thank you, everyone, for attending this webinar. Uh, thank you, Edward, Sonali, Abdulaziz, Mazen, and thank you also, ArabNet and MasterCard, for putting this together. And um, I hope this was very insightful for our viewers. And uh, yeah, hope to see you soon. So thank you.